And so I remember they were watching. I remember, you know, there's kids with CAF who see me and they're like, oh my God, if this guy's doing it, I can do it too. So I knew from all that, that there was bigger than me. And it was literally at that time where it was just so quiet. And I remember my head dropped and I felt like I heard everybody like cheering. Anybody I knew that was tuning in. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. I am your host, Dr. Weta L. Brown. I inspire and promote movement. I explain how running adds to life from a mental wholeness aspect. How obstacles can be overcome in life to make it to your finish line. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast, episode 30. Today, I am honored and privileged to have Roderick Sewell. He is a 29-year-old male, Paralympian, Ironman world champion, finisher. His history is significant for having both of his legs amputated before his second birthday because he was born without tibias. He had a condition called tibia hemimelia, also known as tibia deficiency. This is a condition in which a child is born without tibia, or they can be born with a tibia that is shorter than normal. This creates a difference in the length of the child's legs. It is extremely rare, occurring in only one out of every one million births. Tibia hemimelia usually affects only one leg, but in about one-third of cases, both legs have the condition. And this was the case with Roderick. For many children with tibia hemimelia, limb reconstruction and lengthening may not produce the best outcomes. For example, if the child has no functional ankle joint or is not able to actively straighten the leg, especially if the structures that enable the need to straighten are missing. Reconstruction and lengthening become more challenging, and the best results are usually with an amputation. Many children with tibia mammalia are born with other problems involving their foot and legs, such as a shortened femur or the thigh bone, a bifid femur, the bottom end of the thigh bone is split into two, an absent extensor mechanism, meaning the muscles, the ligaments, and the other structures that help the knee straighten are missing. Club foot, when which the foot is turned inward. Absent toes or mini toes. Some children with tibia hemimelia may also have conditions that affect the arms. Roger got his first pair of prosthetic legs a year after his amputation. He was a growing child, so the man for sockets, feet, and knees became an annual expense. His prosthesis grew more and more expensive, costing about $50,000 per year per leg. It became impossible for his single mother to afford. Sue's mother eventually quit her job that she worked at for 20 years on a naval base and filed for unemployment to ensure that he had full coverage for his prosthetic legs. However, it took a toll on the family financially. Sewell and his mother moved from a house to an apartment and eventually finding himself at shelters. The financial toll took a significant turn when he was about eight years old and continued for the next four years. But it was at this time that he found the Challenge Athletic Foundation, CAF. CAF is a nonprofit organization that provides opportunities for people with physical challenges to play sports. Prior to CAF, he never considered sports because of the prosthesis that he had. He didn't know that these options were available to him. After he was exposed to CAF, the different possibilities in sports became apparent. CEF has been supporting Roderick since with training, equipment, race fees, and travel agents from 8th until now. It is because of them that he found sports and it transformed his life. 
project was introduced to Rudy Garcia Tolson, the CAF. He was the first other double above knee amputee that he'd ever met. Roderick soon became his role model and best friend and showed Roderick what was possible. They actually shared an apartment in New York and competed together at every opportunity they got. Once he met Rudy, it was like an eye-opener. He initially didn't know what he was capable of. By meeting Rudy and his involvement with CAF, he discovered that although he was a double amputee, he could succeed at various endeavors. He participated in many sports. He, although deathly afraid of swimming, saw Rudy swimming, and because he saw Rudy swimming, he knew that he could do it too. It took him about a year to progress to swimming, but he did it. He also ran, played basketball, started hand cycling. CAF gave him an outlet and something to talk about instead of focusing on not having much as a kid. He got his first pair of prosthetic blades from CAF at age nine, then started racing at age 10. He got so good at racing that the foundation flew him out to Florida where he watched other amputee runners compete triumph for the first time. It reassured him that being a gifted athlete was possible. He just had to do it a different way. He and his mother eventually relocated to Alabama, where he would later become the first member of his family to earn a college degree. He holds a bachelor's degree in public communication from the University of North Alabama. While living for a decade in Alabama, Tool trained as a swimmer. He initially avoided the sport, but became proficient at it. He trained from CAF Adaptive Swim Instructors and became an elite swimmer. He qualified for Team USA under coach Nathan Manley at the 2014 Pan Pacific Para Swimming Championship. He earned a gold medal in the 100-meter breaststroke and a bronze in the 200-meter relay. He earned the first world championship medal in 2017 with the bronze in the 34.4 by 100-meter medley. In 2019, he became the first bilateral double amputee to complete the World Ironman Championship, which consists of a 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike, and 26.2-mile run, Across the big island of Hawaii. Again, thank you for joining me. It's such a pleasure and an honor interviewing you. You are truly an inspiration to so many people. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So you were born with a condition called a tibia deficiency or tibia hemimalia, which is a rare condition. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Do you remember anything about any surgeries or anything when you were a child? I don't remember anything. I don't remember having my legs, pretty much. I had them amputated when I was a year and a half, or I should say my mom had them amputated. Mm -hmm. And the first time I remember walking was on prosthetics. They were very, you know, small baby legs, but I remember adjusting and being comfortable in them. And I think it's because I got started at such a young age. So you received your prosthesis about a a year later after you had your surgery. So you're about two and a half. Or three. Yes, ma'am. So you, you do remember the first prosthesis. You remember learning to walk with them. I remember they were, you know, they they weren't too fancy. They were very basic and, and they're maneuvering. Like I said, they were comfortable. There was something that it wasn't too hard for me to get adjusted to. I remember seeing pictures of me back then trying them on. I used mm-hmm. to go to this place called Scope Prosthetics. Okay. And they put me on their pamphlet and I'm like this little kid with this hat on and mm-hmm. swinging on the swings and playing in the the jungle gym. And, um, you know, this is stuff I never did before because I was, my legs were in a, you know, in a way holding me back. Okay. So once I got the amputation and I was able to kind of adjust to this new way of life, then I got my prosthetics and I had already kind of built this, like I'm using my arms for everything. So even with my prosthetics on, I'm just climbing Mm -hmm. and and building strength. And yeah, it was, for me, it's just another way of life. 
you know, it's okay. not too, it's just the way I live. So the fact that you were growing, did you require like a new prosthetic every year or how, how did that work as far as you getting a replacement? Uh, it really depends on how fast. There were a couple of times a year where I would get casted once, maybe twice to mm-hmm. have my socket formed. Okay. And that was a good time. You know, that was when it was at its best. But there were multiple times where I got older and I was just getting big, mm-hmm. <laughs> very big. And mm-hmm. it got to the point where my sockets just weren't fitting. Mm-hmm. So I felt like we were always at the process just trying to like either make the sockets I have better or looking to make a new pair. And how much did that cost approximately like per year since you had to get so many when you were growing? For sure. It was a little different when I was younger. When I was very young, um, it was a little bit more affordable. Okay. The older I got, the more expensive it, it got to take care of. You know, it came to with sockets, uh, knees, feet, parts, labor. You know, a leg was getting up to 30000 a piece at that time. Wow. You know? 30000 a piece? Yeah. Um, yeah. As a baby, it wasn't too much of an issue. When I got older, six, seven years old, where it got pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. Just because I was growing so fast and I was in back and forth in the process. You know, at the time, my mom was working for the Navy and she had a set insurance through the Navy. Okay. And with that insurance, I'm not sure if they gave anything that allowed durable medical equipment on the plan, which is what I needed. Or if she had it, it was very limited. It was a cap or whatever. Yeah. So her, her best choice was to get full coverage for my prosthetics. She was going to quit her job that she'd been working at for 20 years and file for unemployment, get, I, I believe it was Medicaid or I'm trying to remember what insurance it was at the time, but so that you insurance, get full coverage, full coverage. It was very basic, very minimal, but it gave me the full coverage I needed to get my prosthetics, you know, and that was great because I got to grow up living life on my prosthetics and having these legs that, you know, were a blessing. You know, there's people that, that live the same life and don't have the same options when it comes to getting that kind of care. So it was definitely a a blessing, but you know, it came with a cost, you know, we went from having our own house and our own car to selling the house and selling the car. And and then, you know, I remember my mom and I were leaving our old house on her back. She carried me without my legs. I'm just on her back and I'm looking, the car is gone. She's walking me to the bus stop and we caught the bus to our new apartment. And okay. So she sold, sold the, the car. car. Couldn't afford the house anymore. So everything was just kind of going downhill. We have the apartment. We're kind of back and forth for a while. And again, I'm growing up, you know, not realizing what sacrifice she made to make sure that I can even walk on the day to day. How old were you when she quit her job? I had to have been five or six. I had to be about because we were fine for a little bit. And then it just progressively got worse where Thing with family members, family members butt heads, so we got to go pretty much bouncing back and forth. And then we ended up living out of a shelter for a while where, you know, I had no idea what was going on or why we were in this situation. But mm-hmm. so you didn't realize what was going on. You just knew that you were moving around a lot. Did you know, like, your mom was, you knew the whole story about your mom quitting no, the job? She, at the time, she felt like I didn't need to know that part. But I was seeing the effects. And with that, she just kind of uh, reassured me, you know, that it was a partnership between her and I. You know, we're going to pretty much treat each other and and be there for each other through these hard times. And her best way of doing that was I'm going to give him a responsibility because I have my own. And mine was school. Mine was just being a a good kid. Get a kid, yeah. And she took care of everything else. And then I just didn't, I made it easier for her because I had my moments <laughs> like any child does. <laughs> but, you know, I was her partner in crime. But now that I'm older at a stage where I can see myself having a child, when I look back. So you, you, you're giving me like making my eyes sweat because you made me think about my mom because she would have done right. the same thing. That sacrifice. For sure. For sure. But it's, it's sad. It's a sad situation where a person who's working full time has been working for 20 years doesn't have the insurance doesn't pay for something that you need the fact that she needed to quit her job in order to get something that Mm -hmm. you needed 
I mean, that's that's just a sad uh, situation on our healthcare system in the United States. Pretty rough. And I, when it comes to prosthetics and any kind of equipment, mm-hmm. wheelchairs, crutches, it's, it hasn't necessarily gotten much better. Nope. Nope, yeah, it's so not. There's definitely some changes that need to be made there. Um, I definitely feel like we have more of a, a voice now with the way things are going and kind of announcing that, okay, we have these disabilities but we shouldn't have to pay however 100000 to walk. No. Yeah, expe- especially if you want to be active. Then you're just asking too much. Yeah. But yeah. So how did you cope? I mean, you didn't really know the full extent, but you knew things weren't normal. They weren't the way they were before. Though. How did you kind of cope with? I, crazy, that around that same time that we were going through the worst of it, I had my family who they had known me all my life pretty much as an amputee. You know, my younger cousins met me when they were younger and all my aunts and uncles. My my grandma has 12 kids and my mom's the oldest. Okay. So we all, it's just a huge family. And they knew me as that. And so it kind of made it easier that I'm growing up and interacting with children who didn't view me as a kid with no legs. They were just, I was just their cousin, Robert. So I, I think I definitely learned a lot of social skills, just a lot of bonding. And it was a change when I had to go to school because those kids had no idea what was going on. They didn't know anything about prosthetics or what was happening to me. And it, it was just that, mm-hmm. that wonder. And a lot of people didn't attract to me the same way my family and friends or the few friends I had did. Were they nice or were they just kind of awkward? They were awkward. They just didn't know how to react to it because it was it was something that adults didn't know how to react to. So I can't look back and blame the children. But, you know, I had those few that you always meet somebody who has a family member or a friend or um, does just doesn't care, just sees the person, you know. And luckily I had that I had that bonding throughout my life. And then when we were going through the hardest part in the shelter, I got started with the Challenge Athletes Foundation. And okay. with them, you know, I'm learning that I can do adaptive sports. I can do sports for people that are in wheelchairs. I can do sports for hand bikes. I can, uh, I can do any sport. So how did you uh, connect with them? Was it through the YMCA or how, how was that connection initially? So it was very, you know, it was kind of random. I remember my mom and I had just left the shelter. And, um, you know, we leave these shelters at certain, sometimes it depends on the one you stay at. You're leaving at either 4 a.m., 5 a.m. because they have to use a facility for something else during the day. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you get a shelter where you got a cot and you got your own curtains and you can mm-hmm. leave at like eight or nine after breakfast, which was the mm-hmm. best, you know. Mm-hmm. I remember we left out of the more, <laughs> the better shelter and we were standing there waiting on the trolley. And there's this woman across the tracks that just sprinted across towards my mom and I. Her name is Marla Knox. She works for Disabled Sports. And okay. I remember there were two trains coming, two trolleys coming from both directions. And she did not care. She bolted. She dodged both those trolleys and she jumped in front of my mom and my face and said, have you heard of the Challenge Athletes Foundation? And I remember my mom and I looked at each other like this woman just. <laughs> almost got hit by a trolley. <laughs> we looking like we almost saw an incident. <laughs> now she's in our face talking about CAF or whatever that is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it was it was just an eye opener because she she really kind of risked her life to tell us about this foundation. Mm-hmm. And once we got started, it was just all downhill from there. It was, you know, we did okay. everything with them. We met Tabby King, who was partnered with CAF. OK. And then I met Rudy Garcia Tolson, who, okay. you know, he's the first other double above me amputee that I met similar to myself okay. that's walking and living on prosthetics. OK. So what sports did you initially do when you start working with CAF? You know, I was very new to the to everything. So I was just kind of open to whatever they had to offer. I got involved in wheelchair basketball. I tried hand cycling. Okay. What else did I do? I got my first pair of running blades from them when I was nine. Okay. I got... I got my first pair of swim lessons or my first few swim lessons from them. Okay. That was done at the YMCA in San Diego. Yeah. Anything I could get into, any sport that they had going on, 
I tried it all. Wheelchair rugby. Rugby, okay. Yeah, okay. A- anything. I was reckless. I, I tried mono skiing, and my mom did not like that one. Really? Yeah. Did you? I, I loved it. <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, I'm flying down a hill, top speed, yeah, one ski. Like, yeah. of course, I loved it, but she was <laughs> not happy. <laughs> she was freaking out. She was freaking out, for sure. I uh, saw so a quote. It's about being active and able to enjoy being out and about. You realize it wasn't just about having a good time that you wanted to lead a more healthy lifestyle. You weren't restricted anymore. It was about being active and CAF gave you those tools. Mm -hmm. So CAF basically helped change your life. They really set it on a a path. And I think what it was is that it gave me that community. Individuals that were like me and, or not even like me, just living with a disability, whether it's visual or not. And just seeing the difference and yet the similarities in all these different individuals because it's, it's people worldwide that CAF are helping. Okay. So it's really just multiple disabilities, different cultures, and just having that exposure, you're like, oh, okay, I'm not alone. You know, when we disperse, when we're all back at home and we're the only person in, with a disability in our area, I can remember, okay, I had that community or I have that community that's understanding what I'm going through and gives me what I need to, to live the life I deserve to live. And now as I'm older, I'll try to do the same thing and, and help give back and really tell people about CAF and let them know that if you have a disability, this is, this is for you. This is to show Mm -hmm. you that regardless of your disability, you're going to live a full life. You're going to do and be an active living, (laughs) breathing person, a normal person, just like anybody else. You might do it differently, but you're going to do it. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's what I appreciate the most. So you mentioned an article that you were afraid of water when you were eight and you saw another child and that was Rudy swimming eventually you said that you could do it because you saw another person like you swimming and you realized that you could do it as well which I think that proves why representation matters because if you see someone who looks like you whether it be like person of color and minority or, or, or physical disability if you see someone who looks like you it makes you more likely to believe that you can do it too. For sure. And I remember seeing Rudy do it, seeing him swim. And immediately the one fear I had of, oh, I can't swim because I don't have legs. That fear was gone. But there was definitely layers. I had already, obviously, you know, I had heard by then, you know, Black people don't swim. Mm -hmm. I got that in my head. (laughs) And then apparently I had an incident when I was a baby that I didn't know about where you didn't remember. Yeah. It probably was like in your mind mm-hmm. and fear. Another situation where I was just completely not knowing what I, what fear I had. And then obviously all that's building and then the legs are not having legs that just capped it for me, you know? So once I saw that, I realized that, okay, all my excuses are invalid. You know, <laughs> like I, I can swim. I can do anything I put my mind to. And it's really paid off because now I'm older and I, I, I've raced for USA on three national teams. I mm-hmm. I completed the Ironman in 2019. And, yes. and I have plenty of questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, you know, I just see how people are inspired by it. And I remember it being just something that I was trying to overcome at first, you know, and, and now. So how did you learn to love it and excel at it? Because obviously you're a great swimmer. And then you, I know you mentioned somewhere it said freed your body mm-hmm. and your mind. And I had that same like feeling with running. It kind of like it's it's freeing. So like how'd you get over that that fear to to love it? It took um honestly repetition. Very small, small progressive I I would say drills or techniques just to get me comfortable with the water first. Because mm-hmm. that was the goal is to uh, overcome that. Oh, you fear. like those drills, those boring drills that you do? Uh, you have to, uh, you know, you got to do, <laughs> <laughs> you have to do the baby steps in order to get to where you yeah. want to be. And, but you know what? You learn to find and feel that comfort. And then once you do, it, it's such a release. You know, I love that regardless, legs or not, when I get in the water, I can move or, or feel the way I want to feel. And like, like you said, it is, it is very much there. You know, I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. and the water is quiet. Um, I'm mm-hmm. very, I feel more balanced when I can be in the water and still move and, and, and flow the way I would like to. And yeah, it kind of gets you in that Zen state. 
you know, where you're just constantly like moving back and forth, like moving your energy from from left to right while you're swimming. I definitely get the same feeling when I run as well. Mm -hmm. It's definitely more, I feel like I find a certain rhythm and everything else is just coasting on that. You know, you just find a certain Mm -hmm. pace and you just feel like, I I personally, I just feel, I don't want to say lighter, but I I feel... It's like you're free. Yeah. Freer. Yeah. Yeah. So I was reading about some of your swim sessions, like you swim like seven days a week and... Includes a lot of sprints. You still swimming seven days a week? Um, six days a week. I take one day off. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we're doing five thousand meters, if not four thousand, maybe three thousand if it's an easy day. <laughs> three thousand is easy a day for you. Three thousand is an easy day. That's a day where, well, sometimes not all the time because it sounds like less, but that just means we're sprinting more. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> so tell me about your experience when you were in the U.S. para swimming team. Was it two thousand fourteen? 2014, I went to okay. the Pan Pack Championships in Pasadena, okay. California. My first national team for USA and going into it very uh, just green. you know. Mm-hmm. And I remember being there and feeling that environment of I'm representing my country and being with teammates that feel the same way and meeting other countries where they feel the same way about their country and the friendships and the bonds that you form. I feel like that's the part. The gold in the Paralympics is obviously this one thing we're all working towards, but mm-hmm. the people you meet and the the journey you have, the, the hard times you go through, that's the part that really, that I remember. That you remember. Yeah. So you don't remember the, the gold and the bronze that you won? <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I should mention. Yeah. No, I mean... <laughs> Those, that part is fun too. I'm not gonna lie. Okay. That part is fun okay. too. But you know, what events? What did you win? Those? It was the gold. Was in the was it breaststroke? I think it was. Oh man. Oh my. I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> the see, I had just really crazy. The bronze was in. It had to be the relay. Okay. Yeah, I think the bronze was the relay, and I swam the breaststroke leg of the relay. Okay. Okay. It was only a 200. That's, breaststroke is hard for me. The breaststroke is my main, main stroke. And I think that's, that's the one I got gold in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, pretty, that's awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. So what sparked your interest into um, triathlons? Honestly, I didn't do many triathlons. Mm-hmm. It's because of my time with the Challenge Athletes Foundation. And every year we have this huge fundraiser called San Diego Triathlon Challenge. Okay. We have individuals come worldwide to race in this triathlon together. And it's our, we have tons of stuff going on the weekend. Uh, we have the race mm-hmm. on Sunday. We have our million, million dollar challenge, we call it, where we have cyclists ride from San Francisco to San Diego. How many miles is that? I think it's like 600, 680, something like that. So they do like 100 something a day. That's impressive. It's, it's wild, but it's such a fun, it's, it's grown to this huge reunion. Where, you know, you see people that have been there for 20 plus years and you see all the new kids and the new athletes and new individuals that just heard about CAF. And it's it's just amazing. So that's what got me involved with triathlon was the fact that it was kind of the the endurance sport of CAF. Okay. And then I, I did a half Ironman in April of 2019. Okay. That was Oceanside? Oceanside, yep. Okay. I swam the swim portion, which was 1.2 miles, and I did it in like 32, 33 minutes. That's impressive. Yeah, it was okay. It was all right. <laughs> impressive to me. <laughs> and uh, I had a teammate do the, the biking leg because at the time I didn't have a bike and I didn't okay. want a bike. You didn't? No. And then um, the running portion, this was my first time running anything longer than six miles. Okay. It was a half marathon, 13.1 miles. And I had ran it an hour and 39. That's impressive too. I was shocked because I, again, I had never run anything more than six miles. So I was very... So you has had that stamina mm-hmm. from all that swimming. I think that's what it was. 12 years of swimming and, mm-hmm. and doing distance swimming. And I joke with people because uh, <laughs> I tell them that I used to swim 10,000 meters a day. And, you know, I think that's really what built up my endurance. 10,000 meters a day, yes. Yeah. I don't swim that in a week. <laughs> <laughs> not now yeah that's impressive it's a lot you know it's a good amount but that's where i think that's where a lot of my strength came from 
And it paid off because after that race, Iron Man spoke to CAF. And I, I think there was talk of, okay, we're going to give CAF these many slots for athletes. Okay. And you, you pick who you want to race. And I remember I spoke to Bob Babbitt, who's a co-founder. And Rudy mm-hmm. as well was there at the race in Oceanside. And they were like, you know, we can see you doing something here. Um, okay. Whether it's marathon running or just Ironman. So I started training, started focusing on 2019. No, I, I put my Paralympic training to the side just to focus on this. So you started training like the early part of the year, the year you did the um, actual world champion Ironman. Okay. Uh, early 2019. So still, you know, I have swimming. Swimming is in the bag. Running has gotten stronger. I just haven't been on a bike. July comes around. I get the lottery slot from Ironman to compete in Ironman World Championships. And they are three months away. <laughs> but you have been training, though. I've been training, but I still didn't have a bike. So you've been swimming and running. Swimming and running. Okay. And so CAF I helped me get my first kneeler hand cycle. Okay. And I just put in hours on hours on the thing because I knew everything else was good. I had focused so much time on swimming and running while I was waiting on the bike that the bike was my weakest. This is where I need to focus. How many hours a week did you bike? So when I first got my bike, I would do an hour every other day uh, just to kind of get used to it and get a technique. And then after two weeks in, I would do two hours every, every other day. Okay. And then eventually I would build up to three hours every other day. And the days that I would have a harder workout, I would do three hours and then a swim or three hours and then a run just to kind of keep my strength in those disciplines. But it got to the point where it had to be a three-hour ride or I didn't want to ride my bike. Anything shorter, I bored me. I needed long. Really? Yeah, because I had just trained my mind to... To do the long. Yeah, I knew how long I would be out there. So I just wanted my mind to get used to the idea of going long. And I think the longest ride I did was 90 miles. Mm-hmm. How long it take you to do it? Uh, about eight hours, I think. Okay, so eight hours was your longest ride prior to the actual race. Yeah, yeah. Did you have any problems like adjusting to the length as far as the riding since you did it in such a quick period of time? Yeah, I didn't really have any problems, I don't think. But I kind of used my time to focus on technique and really think about how I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. So because, like I said, the bike was my weakest, I, I spent the most time getting comfortable with that first because it does wear and tear on the arms. No, oh, yeah, I can imagine. The elbows for sure, the lower back. What about your shoulders? My shoulders as well. With swimming and cycling, it was just a, a, a huge load. Mm-hmm. And so I was definitely, you know, I had a physical therapist that would see me once a week. His name was Neil out of New York. And okay. he was helping me out. I did my own recovery. Uh, I tried to do a lot of stretching. I tried to do a lot mm-hmm. of massaging. I tried to do a lot of uh, just keeping maintenance. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it paid off. It, it definitely, you know, it benefited in the long run. Tell me about the actual race. The the race. Mm-hmm. It's a long day. 16 hours and 26 yeah. minutes. Season two, I will start a new series called Ask the Doc. If you have questions related to musculoskeletal injuries or musculoskeletal health, please send me a voicemail. Go to my website at www.weouilove.com. Click on the tab Voicemail. Leave your voicemail and select messages will be aired and answered on the segment. Now, back to the episode. That's impressive, though. Tell me about the the race, though, in, in detail. The swim you aced, I'm sure. What was your time you remember? The swim was 2.4 miles, right? And mm-hmm. I swam an hour and nine minutes. That's impressive. That's impressive. Well, I, I wasn't happy about it. Because... From this slow turtle swimmer. <laughs> that is impressive. <laughs> I was, well, so we did a, we did a test run a week before and I swam an hour and seven. I was like, why, why am I slower race day? When I did my 70.3, my time was 50 minutes or 52. And my Ironman, this one was canceled, but my goal was 145. Which uh, 70.3 did you do? Augusta and also did Grand Rapids. It's not an Ironman race, but um, Grand Rapids 70.3. Okay. That's cool. 
I just learned to swim in 2017. So nice. It's never too late. But you're a fish compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will say the swim portion of Kona was it was the roughest I've dealt with. Yeah. It was very, you know, the once the wind starts picking up. Mm-hmm. It's choppy. Just, yeah, so choppy. So, so choppy. I've never gotten out of the open water swim and felt like nauseous. But oh, oh, yeah, mm, I hate that. That time I did for sure. My stomach was turned. How did you manage after you finished the swim? You were nauseous and then, then you had to get on the bike and, and go, basically. There's no time to waste. No there. time to waste. <laughs> I was like, all right, my stomach is turned. I need to, what I did, I did a lot of deep breathing exercises before the race. And then I, mm-hmm. whenever there was a time when I was training or in this point during the race, when I felt like, oh, something's in pain, I really just focused on my breathing and I focused on the area. So I would okay. just take deep breaths and kind of relax that area. My first transition was, I think it was seven minutes. Mm-hmm. That's good though. Uh, it felt, <laughs> it felt so slow. But it was enough for me to get myself comfortable before I took off on the bike, you know? So what did you do about nutrition with your, with your n- nausea? Did you have any issues keeping, like, fluids down, food down? For sure. I was very anxious, I think, because I I was so strict about a schedule. Like, okay, my body takes this long to break something down. I need to have something every 30 minutes. And it was just, it was too on the dot instead of me just listening to my body. Mm-hmm. So eventually, yeah, I couldn't put any more food down. I actually, on the bike course going up Pavi, I remember throwing up twice. No. Yeah, because it was just, I tried to push too much drink down, too much food down. What were you drinking? I'm just curious. I, so I'm sponsored by Vega. Yeah, Vega's really good. I used their drink mix, but I think I was eating and drinking way too much, way, way too much. I didn't really let everything settle like it should have. And, you know, the bike. So did you eventually settle like toward the end? Did your stomach kind of settle toward the end of the bike or? Well, after, you know, it's funny. After I threw up, I felt better. I was I was feeling very, very much better. And then I said, OK, I'll wait a while. And if I get hungry, I'll eat something and I'll drink every 20 to 30 minutes if I need to. And I was doing before that I was eating every 30 minutes, drinking every 15 minutes. And it was just it was too much. What was the temperature? It was actually, we had some cloud coverage, which kind of helped. So what hot is? Um, it was, I think it got up to 100 at one point. So it was hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, you know, there's definitely been hotter years. But, you know, the bike course, once I got to the halfway point and got my peanut butter and jelly sandwich, at that time, you're just coasting downhill with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Oh, my gosh. With this beautiful view. <laughs> so tell me about the run. Like, so you made through the bike and that was what you remember your time? Um, the bike was right under nine hours. Okay. Yeah. And I made it with 30 minutes to spare before the cutoff. Okay. Which was the fear that me, Rudy and Bob from CAF, this is the fear we had was, okay, we're going to hope he makes the cutoff because it was my weakest, you know? But you did it. We got it done. We got onto the run. I think once the run started, I was like, oh my God, this is happening. Cause (laughs) this is really happening. (laughs) Because it was, it was just so much anxiety over the bike. And we knew the swim was going to be fine. So that's probably why your belly was all on the bike. You were worried. Yeah, yeah. And obviously from the swim before, too, I think it, everything was just tossed around. But once the run starts, the first nine to ten miles are just, it's hard to pace it. Because you're running through the city now. You're running through, like, Kona. Everybody knows the race is going on. At this time, people know that I'm competing, and yeah, I just I just hear friends and family cheering from the bars, and it was it was so cool. We're just running along the water, and you know everybody, you feel the energy. You definitely on the run is when I felt the most energy from everybody on the island and everybody that I knew was listening or watching or checking in to see how I was doing. I I literally, I felt like I could feel anyone's prayer. And then once the day was over, those would be the people I'd hear from. Like, oh my God, I can't believe you did this. But (laughs) the fast paced 10 mile run leads to a quick mile walk on mile 11. Okay. Because you're not around the people anymore. You're out on the Queen K Highway and it's very quiet. (laughs) And so I walked, I remember I walked for a mile and I told myself I wouldn't walk until I needed to. And I was happy that it was mile 11. Mile 12 comes around. I start running again. I find a, a decent rhythm. 
and then miles 16 to 17, I walked. And I probably shouldn't have walked at this time, but... Yeah, you still had a little bit left in you to run. I could have kept going, but there was one point when I looked at the island and the way that the town sat on the island and just the way the lights were kind of beaming off this, this huge mountain. And it made me think of Colorado Springs, honestly, which is where I'm living now. Okay. And just the way this small town sits on this huge mountain, you know, it, it's captivating. And I remember looking at it for a solid mile, like, oh my God, this is beautiful. I'm just going to take this in for a little bit. Um, and then I realized, oh, I'm in a race still. I need to start running. So mile 17 comes and I remember I'm coming out of the energy lab. So I come out at mile 19 and I remember seeing individuals running into the energy lab. So they had just finished maybe mile 13, 14. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was pushing it. I was cutting it close. So if I was cutting it close, every individual I saw running into the lab was... Cutting it close? Yeah. They, well, I don't think they were going to make the cutoff. Oh, okay. Because it was very... And I think they knew it because it was just very quiet, you know, when they're going by. and Just very like, what do you say? What do you do? So I just kept going. And uh, mile 20 hit and I started walking. Okay. My stomach is in knots at this point. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have six miles left and I'm just like, I have nothing left in the tank. I've used it all at this point. And this is where my, my coaches, my friends and family told me, you know, this is where your why needs to come in mm -hmm. and why you're doing this. And I remember it was just so quiet. It's a, it's, it has to be like 1030, if not 10 o'clock at night on an island, right? So you just see the stars, you see the mountains, you see the city, a few lights. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being in such a Zen state, just very like, just happy to be there first off. And it was an internal thing first where I was like, you're doing this for you. Mm -hmm. This is a challenge placed in front of you. It doesn't make you or break you. You're doing this for yourself to show that to yourself that you can't do it, whatever the challenge is. And I knew after I said that, what followed was the people that are watching. You know, my family was watching. My friends were watching. You know, my family is used to wondering and, and fearing what was going to be in my life. Who was I going to be? Uh, they didn't, they never seen anybody li living a prosperous lifestyle as a amputee in prosthetics. Mm -hmm. So they, for years, there was just fear of, you know, what's going to be of, of Roderick. Mm -hmm. And so I remember they were watching. I remember, you know, there's kids with CAF who see me and they're like, oh my God, if this guy's doing it, I can do it too. Yes. So I knew from all that that it was bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And it was literally at that time where it was just so quiet. And I remember my head dropped and I felt like I heard everybody like cheering. Anybody yes. I knew that was tuning in. Mm -hmm. And it was enough for me to, because I did the Ironman shuffle for a solid mile, mile and a half, where I'm just, I try to run and then I start walking. Yeah, you're like, yeah. <laughs> I try to run again and then I'm, immediately halted <laughs> back to walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know how that is. Yeah. <laughs> After I felt that that kind of hit of energy of this is this is bigger than anything any pain I'm in right now or anything I'm going through, I started running again around mile twenty one or twenty two, I believe. Okay. And at this point there there are people driving and riding by saying if you don't start running now, you're gonna miss the cutoff. Okay. So I start running out I'm getting closer. And the last mile is there. Mm -hmm. I remember I see Rudy. He's my handler for the whole race. So he's making sure I have okay. everything I need. And I give him like a fist pump. But like, if you look at my face, I am not, <laughs> I was not there. I, it took everything in my body just to lift my arm to like give him a tap. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's how gone I was. Because I, I had my, my rhythm and my run. I had my, mm -hmm. my momentum and I just, my arms couldn't go anywhere. My my body, if I tripped up, my body was spasm from like my shoulder down to my wow. leg. And so I was okay. like, I have to stay in this one position of, of moving. Mm -hmm. And I remember Rudy was like, I just last mile, you got this. Um, you're good. You're in the clear. Just keep going. And yeah. I'm coming into the finish line. Okay. I remember freaking out at one point because I was like, this is the longest mile <laughs> in, <I know>. in <laughs> history. <laughs> Like you're almost there. <laughs> right. You keep telling me how close I am. It doesn't look that way. And I remember, I'll never forget this. I, I hope I meet the individual that heard me. But I remember shouting. I remember shouting like, where is this finish line? 
And this guy on the bike, like, pointed, like, oh, it's right here. You're almost there. I was like, oh, my God. I knew I was hangry. I knew I was hangry by the way I said it. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, he was so nice. Like, oh, yeah, you're, you're almost there. It's fine. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank you. And, um, you know, I'm coming in, and I see the finish line. It's close to midnight now. It um, mm-hmm. has to be close to, like, 1130. And I see all these people lined up, you know, they've been mm-hmm. cheering all day, volunteering, helping all day. And now everybody's here at the finish line, cheering on every individual that comes in. And as I'm coming in, I'm looking and I'm like, this is really happening. And in my eyes, I'm like, uh, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not tripping. I'm not like, this is all ending right now, this full day. Like I, when I started the race, the sun wasn't even up yet. And as I'm uh, finishing the run, the sun's going down, it's getting dark. And the day is done. I remember I got to the finish line and I did like a breath of relief. And I remember Mm -hmm. I tripped at the finish line. I didn't fall. I definitely like, I was so happy to be done. (laughs) Mike Riley said, you are an iron man. You know, it was um, the biggest thing for me is my mom was there. Okay. Obviously, Iron Man's doing this whole special with NBC and they're like, we want you there. I told them that the only way I would participate if you brought my mom out to the race okay. and okay. make her a part of this as well. Cause if you want my story, she's got to be involved. Yeah. So to have her there to, to be completely honest, I didn't tell her what the race consisted of. I didn't tell oh, her. She didn't know. She had no idea what kind of race I was doing. She was so nervous for her child. <laughs> they did like a little promo video and they showed the conditions and how long it was. And I remember she did this slow turn and look at me like, that's what we're here for. <laughs> and I just looked at her like, well, we got you a vacation, but uh, I got to suffer for it. <laughs> but, you know, for him to say, like, you're an Iron Man and for her to be there and she just in tears the whole time. And I'm just kind of looking at her like I wanted her to know that this was her doing. I wanted her to know that this was her upbringing. Every every person that's affected by me, you know, I, I want them to know it's because of her. Her name's Marion Sewell. Marion Sewell, okay. She, although her maiden name is Jackson. She goes by Marion Jackson, too. Okay. Okay. And also the, the co-founder of CAF was there, too, correct? Bob Babbitt, yep. Bob Babbitt. Which I have a, a another in- interesting story about him as well. During the run, when I told you I hit mile 20 and it just looked like I wasn't going to make it, mm-hmm. Bob, you know, <laughs> this is why I call him Uncle Bob. He, I've known him since I was little, little, little. And I, I guess he was worried about me. He got on a bike and started biking out onto the bike or the run course looking for me to tell me like, you need to get moving so you can make this cutoff. And he was trying. Well, that's the thing. He never found me. He was riding out there. He never found me. He got hurt. And he, cause he said he, he flipped over, he flipped his bike over in some pole somewhere you didn't see. And I remember coming in and like, I see him now and his legs all bloody and stuff. I'm like, Bob, what's, what happened? man? I've been gone for 16 hours. I come back and you're all injured. And he told me what happened. Like, oh my God, I can't believe you tried to come find me to warn me. And this is what happens to you. But that's the kind of guy he is. He wants his people to succeed and he's going to do everything he can to make it, make it happen. And I, I saw somewhere he commented to watch you go from being an eight-year-old, terrified to swim. To see you cross the finish line was one of the highlights of his life. For sure. You know, he's he's watched us, Rudy and myself, he, he's watched us grow up. So, and he remembers how terrified I was of the water. And to go from that to representing CAF and the Ironman, some, a race that's, to them, that's their Mecca. Mm-hmm. To the triathlon community, that's the Grand Poobah, you know? So to see that and see the effect that it has on up and coming CAF athletes, whether it's children or adults, I think he is definitely something he appreciates. And I do too. I know you mentioned, I think this is your quote, the beauty of the Ironman is you're racing people of all ages and abilities. And it doesn't really matter who you are. It's going to be hard. And it's a metaphor for life because no matter who you are, life is hard. You have certain obstacles that you have to make you through no matter who you are. So you just got to kind of keep going. Yeah, it's the classic metaphor. And it's beautiful because we're all out there alone, but we're together. Mm-hmm. So I know something else did, that you said. The hardest part is changing people's mindsets. You find it funny that people always want to help you 
and ask if you need assistance, but you're thinking that you're as capable as anyone else. And your favorite part is seeing that inspiration triggered into the next generation. Mm -hmm. I would say um, with the individuals that want to help, I don't take it away from them because I, I understand they're trying to do a good deed and they feel like they're helping out. But I definitely think we're in a time where if an individual needs help, they would ask, especially if they have a disability, knowing that yeah. they would need some assistance. I think we're in a time now where individuals with disabilities have more of a voice and can speak up and say, you know, don't don't treat me any differently. And for me, I, I try to be humble and, and let people, you know, I guess if they want to help, they can help. But I, I feel like I'm the last guy that's going to really ask for help um, unless mm -hmm. I truly need it. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I just caution people to question why they're asking for help or a asking to help somebody with a disability. You know, I just wonder where it comes from. Is it is it more of a view of, oh, I see this person as disabled, so that must mean that they need help? Or mm -hmm. is it, I truly just want to help? It's kind of hard. I was having a discussion with one of my friends. We were talking about triathlon, just as far as the fact that it's not diverse. And when we talk about diversity, not just people of color, not just women, but we're talking about ableism and how if you're different from the mainstream, you're discriminated against. You don't think about things. I had surgery, so I wasn't able-bodied for a couple of months. And it's, it's interesting how, first of all, people stare at you. And sometimes you need help. And I did need help, but I, went, I had a meeting at the hospital. And I could walk, but I had crutches. So they were like, you want to correct when wheelchair? I was like, no, I'm walk. Just slow down and, and tell me where to go. Because most people, if like you said, if, if you need help, you're going to ask for it. But you want to do as much as you can for yourself. And it's not like you're asking for help or a handout. You just, if you need a hand, you ask for it. But you want to do the best you can, the most you can on your own. Because you're, you're a person and you have abilities and you want to be treated just like anybody else. Right. Exactly. I agree. Any words of advice for anyone interested in triathlons, swimming, or just any inspiration in life? Because you're so inspirational in all aspects. And I just love what you do as far as your ability and giving to CAF and YMCA. And your life is just an example of you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And your mother, too. Your mother is amazing. If it's anything that I would say, and this is something I, I feel like I'm still learning. But the the work is constantly internal. Mm -hmm. It's a constant internal work. And I think I've learned that from my mom when it comes to patience and resilience. I think I've learned that from myself. You know, I remember a time when I was younger and my mom stood me in front of a mirror with my prosthetics on because at the time I didn't want to wear them. They were either uncomfortable or I just wanted to not walk around in prosthetics. But mm -hmm. she knew that I had to get comfortable in it. And I only I could really find comfort in that. So she stood me in front of a mirror and I remember I was crying, 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 crying. And I'm like, oh, I want to get out of these. I'm not comfortable, blah, blah, blah. And I remember looking at her and seeing she had kind of an angry face or like a, a determined face, but also tears swelling. You know, she's like, I, it was a situation where she couldn't help me. I had to find comfort in myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I remember I stopped crying and I kind of looked at myself like a, like a partner, like we're, we're figuring this out we as in myself, <laughs> figuring this out together. And it's always been that internal work towards like, okay, my, I know this takes a toll on my body, but my, it's all the mind. Anybody that's doing triathlon or anything knows that it's not necessarily your physical capability, it's your mental capability. It's what you can push through, it's what you can endure. Yeah, it's all, all that's determined on your will. And I believe that's mental. If it's a test of will that you're looking for, then triathlon is a sport for you. It is. Do you say any mantras or anything in tough situations when you're racing? Something to, to keep those negative voices out of your head? Or you just do it? I wouldn't say I have a mantra, but I definitely, what I try to use is a form of gratitude. Mm -hmm. You know, I've just gotten to the point where when I wake up in the morning and I, I list out things that I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. One of the first being my consciousness and my awareness and um, just being me, the internal me, you know, not necessarily just the physical black male, amputee, whatever anybody wants to put a label on, just me, myself. And starting with that and step by step, looking at the things that I'm grateful for and the things that I'm blessed with. And mm -hmm. it's interesting once that happens, how, how much 
more I'm I'm lifted. How much more? even mm-hmm. even during the hard times, you know. Yeah, change your mindset. Yeah, and and that's kind of been my my route is okay. This is hard, but I'm still grateful for this. You know, when I'm doing a hard set, and like all oh, my arms are burning. Well, at least my arms have the ability to to be at the speed to do something like this. And I should admire and appreciate that. And then it turns into you finishing a, a set that you didn't think you could finish, or it turns into you hitting a time that you didn't think you could hit. And that constant work can produce some pretty amazing results. Good. Great. Where can people find you? Where can people find me? I uh, have my own website. Okay. www.rodericksoul.com. I have an Instagram, rsoul92. Twitter, same thing, rsoul92. And then my Facebook is Roderick Soul Jackson. I put my mom's maiden name on that one. And yeah, if anybody wants to keep up with me, also, if you feel like I have my email, phone number, <laughs> I can give you whatever you need. I'm always, I'm always a caller or a text away. So what's your next race? I know COVID has kind of messed up last year and part of this year. So what is your next event? It's been tough because, like you said, COVID has really put a, a, a wrench into a lot of plans. But there's a swim competition coming up in the middle of April in Texas. There's a cycling competition coming up in Huntsville, Alabama, which would be nice. I get to go visit some family. And as of now, you know, th- it looks like the Paralympics are going to happen. Okay. It would be tough for me to get classed in swimming. So it might be a little tough to compete in that. How does that work as far as the, the class? So it goes off your disability. Okay. And they class you for each event, swimming, or sorry, freestyle, backstroke, breaststroke, and uh, butterfly. Okay. And um, every year you have to get reclassed, but they only have a certain number of classifications that they give out a year. And unless you're at a certain caliber, I guess is the best way to put it, you hit a certain time that it will put you in a metal range. You would be top three. And then they, I think they have 20 or 25 slots they're going to use to class those people that are in that category. Okay. Um, so it might be tough for me because 2019 was spent Ironman training. 2020, there were there were no races. Mm-hmm. And then 2021, you know, it's pretty much we're here and, and they, they've they selected who they want to select. Okay. So it's we'll see. I still have my cycling and swimming goals for the Paralympics, but if they don't happen, I, I feel like my life has produced so many opportunities that I can't be upset. Okay. This is a goal and this is something that I want to accomplish. But one thing I'm learning is not to identify myself as an Ironman or identify myself as a Paralympian or an amputee. People are so much more than what they identify themselves with. So when you set yourself to one identity, you're kind of limiting what you are. Mm-hmm. So I, I personally, I love to swim. I love to ride my bike. And I feel like I high strong enough to be at that caliber as a Paralympian. But if I wasn't training for the Paralympics, I would still tell people to go swim, go ride your bike, right? Go run. It's it's good for your health. It's good for your mental health, physical health, spiritual health. It's gonna it's gonna help you in the long run. I guarantee it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Your story is inspirational. Thank you again. I will share all of your contact information with my viewers or listeners. All right. That wraps up this episode of Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you already haven't, please download Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast on Apple, Spotify, or however you listen to your favorite podcast. If you have any questions, concerns, or possible show topics, please email runitischeaperthantherapy, O-L-B, Omaha Love Brown. Again, that's runitischeaperthantherapy, Omaha Love Brown, at gmail.com. I also can be reached via Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Handle We Life, We Love. Oh, you are life. Oh, you are love. Thank you, and please tune in again.